Hey everybody, happy Friday and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing a few practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and security professional, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting November 3rd, 2014. In this week's episode, I'll talk about the upcoming Microsoft Patch Day, the implications of an interesting new password hijack, and about a couple of Apple vulnerabilities that are affecting iOS and OS X devices. Let's start with Patch Day. Next Tuesday is Microsoft Patch Day, and the big news is it's actually going to be a huge patch day. Microsoft plans on releasing 16 security bulletins with a ton of updates. Now, 16 isn't a record. They've released that many before, but it's still quite a lot of bulletins, and there'll be a whole heck of a lot of patching going on next Tuesday. The bulletins uh, vary in severity from five critical to eight or nine important and two moderate. And they affect products like Windows, Internet Explorer, Office, and some unnamed Microsoft server software. So long story short, if you're a Microsoft administrator, be prepared for a pretty big patch day. And I highly recommend you test at least the server updates before deploying them in a production environment. By the way, don't forget Adobe shares Microsoft patch day so expect some Adobe updates as well. For the second story, I want to cover an interesting password hijack that has interesting implications on a password best practices. A long time ago, you might remember when I talked about Matt Honan, a Wired writer who had his Twitter handle stolen. It was a very short handle that attackers wanted, so they actually stole it from them. And I won't go into all the details, but essentially the way they stole it from him was social engineering uh, different vendors and using password reset mechanisms. But this week, Another person, this guy was a developer who posted a blog posting on the new social network LO, had his credentials stolen as well. He too had a very coveted Instagram handle, at GB. His name is Grant Blakeman. He had many people wanting that handle. People have been trying to reset his password before, but what's interesting about this story is Grant actually has great password handling practices. He does all the great tips. You know, he uses a password manager so that every site has a different different password with long secure passwords. He also implements two-token authentication when it's available. And yet one morning he woke up with the email from Google saying that his password had been changed when he of course hadn't changed it. So that's what's so interesting about this story. How did the bad guys get his passwords? Now Grant doesn't know for sure, and I'll leave his blog post to explain in more detail if you're interested, but long story short, it turns out that the bad guy somehow forwarded his cellular number to another phone. Grant called his cellular provider, and sure enough, someone was forwarding his cell phone somewhere else. And that's how they got the second token of authentication to log on to his Gmail or Google account. So despite Despite having great password handling practices, he still got hijacked. So what can we learn from this? Well, I think there's two things we can learn. First, you need to realize that no security control is perfect. Two-token authentication is great. I still highly recommend it, and yet it can be defeated. There are actually different levels of two-token authentication as far as how they secure they are. SMS two-token authentication or text authentication is one of my favorites, not because it's the most secure. In fact, it's probably not the most secure. It's might be one of the weakest. However, it's the one that most users can accept because everyone has mobile phones, everyone can get text messages, so there's no real barrier to entry to use this type of two-token authentication. So despite the fact that I actually think it's a more insecure method of getting another token, I'd rather have people using that form of two-token authentication than nothing at all. Uh, but do know that SMS two-token authentication has been defeated before, you know, not just by forwarding cell phones, but Zeus had a mobile variant of its malware, I think it was called Zitmo, that could actually hijack your text messages and forward them to an attacker. So again, tip number one, two-token authentication is great, but realize nothing's perfect. That's why you have to layer different security controls on top of each other. Tip number two is actually kind of new to me too. When Blakeman called his uh, cellular provider and, and figured out that his phone had been forwarded, they were kind of blasé about it. They assured him that only authorized account holders 
holders could make such changes and they authenticate people, and yet somehow this happens. So Blakeman thinks it could be social engineering, but one important tip he noted was ISPs and, and cellular providers and people that support your accounts often will allow you to set up some sort of secret password, some sort of voice spoken passcode, so that when you call your cellular provider, before they let you change account settings, they might ask you verbally for your passcode. And if you've set one up, this is a great way to make sure people can't social engineer them into changing your account settings. So tip number two is if you have any important accounts, you might want to call up your account provider and ask them if they'll set up some sort of passcode for your account so that when you call in, they can really verify that they're speaking to you and not some sort of attacker. Anyway, it was just an interesting password hijack. And despite it, I still highly recommend password managers. I still highly recommend using two-token authentication, even if it's only text-based authentication. But always be aware of the social engineering aspect of security as well. There is a human aspect, so be sure to call up your account providers and add a passcode to your account. For the final, and in my opinion, biggest story this week, I want to cover two OS X vulnerabilities. Let's start with what I think is a minor one really quickly. During the week, a researcher found a vulnerability which they named root pipe. And by the way, there's a new security trend, people naming their vulnerabilities to get more attention. But in any case, root pipe is a local elevation of privilege vulnerability. Essentially, if someone has local access to your OS X computer running Yosemite, they can gain full root privileges, even if they're just a low privileged account. So this is a great uh, a kind of vulnerability for malware, for instance. You know, a lot of time if malware infects a Mac, it has your user privilege. But by default on OS X, your user is very uh, unprivileged until they log in again to get administrative privileges. And this particular vulnerability will allow malware to immediately get root access on your Mac. So it is a big deal locally. That said, it is only a local vulnerability. Something has to already be on your computer or an attacker has to have physical or remote access access to your computer to exploit this vulnerability. So despite it being a, a relatively high severity vulnerability, I don't think it's a huge detail. By the way, the people that disclose the information about root pipe have not shared all the details, and they're going to wait to release those details until Apple has a patch for it. That brings us to the second, in my opinion, much bigger story, and that's uh, the new OS X and iOS malware called WireLurker. During the week, a, a company called Palo Alto Networks released some research about a new piece of Macintosh and iOS malware. And this particular malware, it would start by infecting your OS X computers. By the way, it seems to be primarily spread in China. It was found on a third-party Chinese app store, 467 different applications including many pirated applications, had been uh, trojaned. You know, besides the application, bad guys have added this malware. And if you went to this Chinese app store and uh, installed these pirated apps on your Macintosh, uh, they would infect your Macintosh computer. And then they would actually monitor the USB connections of your Macintosh computer, waiting for you to plug in an iOS device like an iPad or an iPhone. When you did plug in your iOS device, they actually used that to infect your iOS device device. And the big thing about this particular iOS malware is it worked not only against jailbroken iOS devices, but normal ones too. It's actually very difficult to get unsigned code on an Apple iOS device. So usually past iOS malware has only affected jailbroken devices. This particular malware actually takes advantage of Apple's what they call their enterprise provisioning capabilities. They can give particular enterprises a certificate that you use so that you can install special enterprise specific code on your corporate iOS devices, for example. Apparently, these attackers stole a certificate of a legitimate enterprise, and that's what they use to uh, install unique malware on every iOS device that gets plugged into an infected Mac. So anyways, I'll uh, link to Palo Alto's research paper on this. It's actually very good research, an uh, interesting paper. Uh, I will say for the Mac users not in China, this is probably not a huge detail as far as they see. Only only one specific third-party app store in China is, is uh, affected by this right now, but I do guarantee attackers around the world will watch this and you'll 
see this type of technique being exploited in the future as well. That said, if you're not installing applications from third-party sources, you will be fine. If you only use Apple's uh, uh, App Store to get your OS X applications, and you have that check mark in your Apple security to only install first-party applications, you should be uh, very safe from this malware. So it's not a huge detail, but it is interesting, and it's especially interesting to see cross-platform malware on a Mac. So remember, if you're a Mac user, you need security controls. You need antivirus. You need IPS. You need the same security as Windows users today, so go out and get it. So that's all I have time for today. I hope you learned something and found it interesting. But there were more security stories this week. Many of them were interesting. So be sure to check out the blog post associated with this video and check out the reference section where we have links to all those other stories. Speaking of the blog, you might have noticed the blog has totally changed. Previously, I would have told you to go to WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com, but that is no more. Our blog is now located at blog.watchguard.com. If you go to the old site, it will redirect to the new site. But be sure from now on to go to blog.watchguard.com, which has a fresh new design, and hopefully you'll like it quite a bit. On top of that, if you haven't already subscribed to WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com, be sure to subscribe to our blog. That way you'll get updates whenever we post something new. And you can, of course, do that in the subscribe section on blog at watchguard.com. As always, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.